and welcome to a very special archive. Now, if you remember a couple of episodes back, how could you forget, I attempted to play an 8-track cassette tape, uh, like that one, on my, sadly, short-lived shortwave radio station. Tape back. Ah! My tape! My tape! My bread album! My tape has ruined my favorite bread album! No! And while I never quite went through with my little threat on teaching you how to properly reconstruct an 8 track tape loop, oh, screw it. You know, I'm dropping any and all pretense of a regular archive episode here. Uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit as myself, not as that crazy guy that hosts this show, about this format. Now, while this is by no means a comprehensive look at the history and the maintenance and all that of this particular format, it should prove to be a nice little beginner's guide for the uninitiated. Now, if you've been following me on Facebook for the last several months, you have probably read a couple of rants from me as I uh, learned the hard way about the ins and outs of this particular format, this rather quirky, temperamental, somewhat half-baked format. So uh, let's get started. Okay, quick history lesson here. In 1963, Bill Lear, you know, the Learjet guy, developed the 8-track as an expanded, more stable edition of the month's Stereo Pack 4-track tapes, the first format designed for playback in cars. The main difference was that this new design required less internal machinery in the playback deck to operate. Anyway, in 1965, Ford Motors started having 8-track decks as an optional feature in their cars. Shortly thereafter, home units, like mine, were introduced. While the standard cassette tape was already on the market, it still had enough design flaws and fidelity issues that, for the moment, the 8-track was considered the better option. However, during the 1970s, the remaining design and sound issues of cassettes were worked out. Well, as worked out as they were likely to get, and in-car cassette units became much more common. By the early 80s, 8-tracks were rendered mostly obsolete by, again, standard cassettes, though a few 8-track titles, rather bizarrely, continued popping up via record clubs through about 1988. As always, when I go quote-unquote on location, I can't really bring my audio gear with me, so for the umpteenth time, I apologize for the sound quality. Now, a quick rundown of the basics here. 8-track tape is kind of like a souped-up cassette. Now, whereas on a cassette, you've got two quote-unquote programs of two-track, i.e. stereo audio, so here's a standard tape, two tracks per side, and with an 8-track, you've got four programs of 2-track audio, hence 8-track, 2 times 4 equals 8. Now, on a cassette, two tracks are recorded on half the tape running in one direction, and the other two are recorded running in the opposite direction. So, that's how you wind up with the two-sided thing that we all know and love. And with one of these, all four programs are recorded running in the same direction. So, instead of flipping the tape, what you do is you pop it in, it starts playing automatically, and if you want to flip the tape, as it were, you just hit the program switch. Okay, personal story time again. Now, when I bought this unit, for about $7, if you're curious, I, like an idiot, didn't crack it open first to examine it, so I popped a tape in there and it was pretty awful sounding. I popped another tape in there, no difference. I popped another tape in there and it got mangled. So when I got the tape out, not only was the tape totally mangled, it was coated in some sort of thick black gunk. Okay, I apologize for the shaky camera work here, but this was the only way I could get the shot that I needed. 
So what happened was, back to my story, I brought this down here and I cracked it open and I found that the original belt on here had melted and it had sunk into the capstan. Now this head drum and the capstan, which is what helps move the tape along, uh, it melted down in there and that was the mysterious black gunk. And I also found that this lovely, lovely belt had melted into every other conceivable crevice of this thing. So I spent uh, quite a while scraping up bits of the belt on the belt drive here with a small putty knife. Unfortunately, it was kind of my only option. And then I spent an inordinate amount of time with Q-tips and isopropyl alcohol. 91% uh, was the best that I could get my hands on. And just cleaning out as much of it as I humanly could. And... Uh, I also cleaned off the playhead as well, shock of shocks. Since I'm here, I might as well show it to you. You see that big rectangular piece of metal right in the center of the shot there? That is the playhead. And uh, you can clean it with a Q-tip and alcohol as well. And a word to the uninitiated, do not clean it up and down. Do not run your uh, Q-tip like that. You want to move it from side to side because you could kind of grab and break off bits of the, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the playhead on there and uh, leave bits of cotton behind and just make a big mess. But uh, back to my story again. To make sure that I hadn't completely destroyed the deck, I found a rubber band that would fit right here where the belt was just as a makeshift testing device and thankfully I was still able to play tapes uh, though they sounded awful because there's just too much elasticity on a rubber band. So I went about trying to find like a, a large rubber washer, plumbing washer, something like that, but to no avail. And so I tried constructing my own belt out of folded up duct tape, uh, but it was too rigid, not to mention it uh, kept falling apart. Then I tried a Velcro strap, and that was too rigid as well. So I finally broke down and sprang for a custom drive belt, which of course cost more than the machine, uh, but I was still having some problems. Now as you can see here, an 8-track tape is just one big gigantic tape loop. It comes out of here, comes through, plays, and it winds itself back up. Now, unsurprisingly, because of the age and the wear and tear on these things, there's about a 50-50 chance that when your tape hits the joint holding this whole loop together, it's gonna break. So, uh, what I did was I found some little foil splices online, and you might be asking yourself, uh, why foil? Uh, well, it's foil because you need something that will contact the sensor in the deck that kicks it over to the next program. Remember you saw that earlier? Uh, it ha it's supposed to happen automatically if you just happen to hit that point. Now, I've already re-spliced my tape, so I don't really have one to show you here, but what you do is you cut off the old splice with just a pair of scissors, and you place the new splice on the outside playing end of the tape, and that will contact the sensor, and it'll kick over. Obviously, it won't do a lot of good if it's on the inside, even though if you uh, have played with uh, tape before, usually you'd want to splice on the non-playing side, because if you do it on the outside, you're going to cover up whatever's there. But since that area is blank, it doesn't matter, and that's what makes this whole thing work. Now, the thing that annoys me most about 8-tracks is that you can't rewind them. Which makes sense, I mean, just looking at this, how would you rewind this? How would you get this back in here? So, uh, it makes sense. There's nothing to hold anything in. Uh, and I've gotten to the point where when I buy a tape at the thrift store or wherever, I just assume it's not going to work too well. So I fast forward it to almost the end of the program. Then I just pop it open. I advance it by hand until I hit the splice. And uh, then I go from there. Now another thing that happens to these tapes is that the pressure pads decay over time and I tend to refer to this type as bread pudding because uh, when it decays it decays into right about that consistency of uh, bread pudding. So what I do is I take pieces of cut down weather stripping and I just pop it in there and it seems to work pretty well. Now other tapes 
have a uh, spring styled pad and what I use usually is uh, just a piece of felt with uh, adhesive on one side or what you could do is you could use that same weather stripping and cut off just a little slice at the end stick it on there with a, a little piece of double sided scotch tape I've done that as well and it works okay I love these three tab tapes. They're the easiest ones to open. So what you do is you stick your thumb and your forefinger in the cartridge and then you stick a small flat electronic screwdriver in there and uh, just swing it out and pop it open. Nice and simple. Just the way it should be. Of course I'm doing this on camera so it probably won't go 100%. Now notice I've already taken the tape out of here. Uh, make sure you hold the tape so it doesn't unravel on you. Now sometimes the rollers on these things break down and uh, on a side note I, I almost refuse to tackle Warner Brothers cartridges because there are no tabs. I think they're held together with glue and fairy dust. Uh, but anyway, the rollers. Sometimes these things turn to goo. So what I do is I take any tapes that I don't like, anything I can get just as cheap as possible, and I keep them for parts. Now if you've got a good solid roller like this one, what I do is I take an alcohol-soaked so alcohol paper towel and, you know, give it a, a few passes around there, clean it off. It'll take off most of the lubricant grime from the non-play side of the tape. Um, yes, there is lubricant in there. Anyway, then I take it pop it back in, pick up your tape, make sure you don't let it unravel, stick it on its little post, use a screwdriver to get it back in place, try not to touch the play end of the tape if at all possible. And there we go, we're back. Now when I've got my tape mostly back together, I manually advance it for a long while to work out any tension issues. See, it was bunching up there. And I just go around with it for a long time. And uh, what I ultimately do is I work out as many tension issues as possible. I notice I keep a finger on here just very, very lightly so it doesn't uh, rise up and it'll, it'll uh, unspool on you. These are stupidly easy to make unravel. But there you go. Now another flaw with these cartridges is that because of the tension issues inherent in a comically large tape loop, there are almost always fluctuation issues. So I rarely listen to these things on their own. And here's why. Um, here's my uh, KTEL 8-track. And let me just show you here. So yeah, uh, with that, I usually transfer these to CD and go from there. Now, going back to my training as probably the last kid to ever learn analog audio, I know that faster playback leads to better fidelity, fewer dropouts, etc. Um, so, unfortunately, that would mean using more tape. Yeah, and on something like this, it, that would be a big problem. It would be a problem in almost any situation. Uh, but anyway, the, the playback on this unit does not disengage when I hit fast forward. So let me show you. So, as I said, I use it to my advantage. I transfer my tapes to my CD burner, as you see right there, in fast forward. Then I just take the files and I dump them into my computer. And I use Audacity, which is just a, a freeware program, works quite well. And I slow them down. And I use like a, a YouTube video, or if I have another copy of the song lying around, I'll use that to gauge the exact proper playback speed. Now, as far as this unit is concerned, something in fast forward runs about 60% fast. So that's my usual baseline. So, uh, that's it. I will leave you now with a quick listen to the final product of one of my transferred 8 tracks, and I will see you next time on the Archive. And we'll be back to normal, I promise.